Well, uh, today we're continuing on with the Ephesians. We're in Ephesians 1, 15 through 2, 10. And I wanted to read a little uh, thing from our daily bread uh, that has to do with what uh, Paul starts out talking about. <clears throat> it says, Thank thankfulness seems to be a lost art today. Warren Risby illustrated this problem in his commentary on Colossians. He told about a ministerial student in Evanston, Illinois, who was part of a life-saving squad, a lifeguard. In 1860, uh, a ship went aground on the shore of Lake Michigan near Evanston. And uh, Edward Spencer waded again and again into the freezing waters to rescue 17 passengers. In the process, however, his health was permanently damaged. Some years later at his funeral, it was noted that not one of the people he rescued ever thanked him. Oh my goodness. Well, you know, Paul doesn't want to be one of those ungrateful people. He starts out this by being thankful to the Lord and thankful for the body of Christ. Ephesians 1.15, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus, and your love for all the saints, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Paul, after encouraging the believers at Ephesus with the words of the opening of this letter about predestination and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is overjoyed because of the faith he has heard from those who are in Ephesus. They have shown their faith in Jesus and love for the saints. You know, that's the simplicity of what God expects of his followers. It's the Ten Commandments all rolled into one. As we know, Luke 10, 27, he answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. But Paul doesn't stop there. He prays for them. That's what we ought to be doing. He thanks the Lord for them and remembers them in his prayers without ceasing. And we ought to be doing that for one another. We need to thank the Lord for one another. You know, if you're thanking the Lord for a person, you're much less likely to be criticizing them. If you're praying for that person in a spirit of thankfulness, you'll be praying for their good. The Lord tells us to pray for all the saints. <clears throat> Ephesians 6, 18. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. By the way, you can pray and make requests of the Lord. That's what that, that verse talks about. Ephesians 1.17, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Didn't the Lord already say that he gave us the spirit of wisdom in verse 8? Why then would Paul pray for us to have wisdom? Well, it's because we now have access to all wisdom in Christ, even though we do not yet possess it. In fact, we will not know everything till we see him face to face. But we will eventually see clearly. I'm looking forward to that. We're continuing to learn, but the point is, is that we would not have any real knowledge without salvation and the indwelling of the Spirit, who is our teacher. This is something to think about today. A lot of people are out there and think they know everything. You know nothing unless you're born again and you're searching and and studying the scriptures with the Holy Spirit as your teacher. Look at all these scientists. They're completely off. I was watching some program yesterday and they're talking about millions and billions of years and all this kind of stuff. And it's just like, what? <laughs> None of that makes any sense at all. John 14, 26 says, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things 
and will remind you of everything I've said to you. So we have access to all wisdom and knowledge now through Jesus Christ, but we're still in the process of learning those truths. This is why it's a good prayer to pray for the saints that they will be given the spirit of wisdom and revelation. You cannot pray this for unbelievers. Doesn't work. Pray for their salvation. But for the saints, you can ask God to help them to understand, to be discerning, to grow to maturity in Christ so they will know the difference between good and evil, to gain wisdom so they can help others, to understand the revelation of Jesus Christ in his written word. Why? Because then we will know our Lord better. If we know him better, we will trust him more. If we trust him more, he will be able to use us more effectively to reach others for Christ because our faith in him is strong and our knowledge of him is secure. Ephesians 1.18, <clears throat> I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. You know, this is a good prayer to pray for fellow Christians. Sometimes in the difficult times in life, we tend to forget the hope to which God called us and the rich inheritance we claim as his children and his bride. That hope is what can sustain us through the rough times, as it did those who came before us and laid down their lives for the gospel. So what are we to do? We keep our eyes on Jesus and our mind on the things of heaven, and then you will not despair. Verse 19, and his incomparably great power for us who believe, that power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. We as believers have the power of Christ to sustain us. We have the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Think about it. When you think about it that way, you realize we are not powerless, folks. We have not been left as orphans here all alone in a hostile world. John 14, 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. We have the power of the risen and glorified Lord Jesus Christ, who is sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven, making daily intercession for us. Romans 8, 34 through 39. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Never forget that. He is not going to abandon you. He loves you. And he will continue to do so. The resurrection power of God is ours. So, we will be more than conquerors. We can conquer sin, death, the devil, and anything because we're in Christ. His power is our power. Now, that's not talking about the power to do anything we want or a power over other people. It's not talking about the power to fall down backwards and act like an animal. It's not talking about the power to get people to follow us, the power to make money, the power to get guaranteed health the power to command God. It's talking about the power to live, the power to resist the devil, the power to do the will of God. 
The same power God the Father used to raise Jesus from the dead, the same power that overcame death, Satan, and sin is ours through Christ. Think about that, and you'll see that often we just don't realize what God has done for us. And because we don't realize it, we don't claim it. We don't live in it. Verse 21, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Christ is above all those things. Christians have been given the fullness in Christ, who was given authority far above anything created. Colossians 2.10, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. He was given authority for now and eternity in the Father. Because he has the, that authority, we as his children can be assured that the enemy no longer has power over us. That sin no longer has power over us. And that death no longer has power over us. But we need to live in that. We need to claim that. We need to walk with the Lord. One of the key things to understand and claim in dealing with demonic activity in people's lives is that we have the fullness of Christ and he has all authority. If we truly understand our position in Christ, we understand that there's no demonic force that can stand against us. We can then rebuke demonic activity in Jesus' name, not because his name will accomplish anything, but because we understand our relationship to him and the privileges it affords us. Anyone who has been involved in casting out demons from people, etc., will tell you that it's all based on whether or not your relationship with the Lord is, is right. Because that's what the enemy's looking at. He's looking at, does this person have a relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ? Or is he just spouting empty words? Ephesians 1.22, and God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. The Father appointed Christ to be head of his church, the body of Christ. Those who believe in Christ unto salvation are included in Christ himself. We became part of him. We're not the head. He is the head. But we are his body, not the personal glorified body of the God-man Jesus Christ. But in Christ and through Christ, we are his representatives on earth. As we know, we are to be light and salt. One of the most important things about the body of Christ is that he has given us the work of preaching the gospel and discipling all nations, bringing people to the reconciliation that Christ offers with the Father. Mark 16, 15, he said to them, go into the world and preach the gospel news to all creation. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, therefore, and go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 19, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Boy, this is what we need to be all about these days. People need to be reconciled. Jesus Christ is the fullness of his church. This is what Paul states, that Christ fills Everything in every way. That's what that means. You know what? Don't be fooled by new agers and false teachers. They will sometimes use Ephesians 1.23 to, to, to try to teach that God is an imminent God. In other words, that God not only created everything, but he is also everything. God is not his creation. That's pantheism or panentheism at the very least. 
This is how the new age in many cultures, such as American Indians or First Nations people, we're supposed to call them, view God. But God is distinctly separate from his creation. He's separate from the world, Isaiah 40, 22, and Acts 17, 24. He is contrasted with the world. In other words, he's different than the universe he created. Psalm 102, 25 through 27, and 1 John 2, 15 through 17. He created the world, Genesis 1, 1, Psalm 33, 6, 102, 25, Isaiah 42, 5, and 44, 24, and John 1, 3, and Romans 11, 36, Hebrews 1, 2, and 11, 3. <laughs> there are so many verses. God is omnipresent, but he's not imminent. God is not his creation. Very key thing to understand. However, there are many ways that Christ fills all in all. He filled the world with inhabitants. He fills all places with his omnipresence. He fills all creatures with proper food and sustenance. He fills our every need. He fills all his church with his gracious presence in the Holy Spirit. He fills the various churches around the world with those who can lead them, those with the gifts and graces of his spirit. He fills all and every one of the saints with his Holy Spirit. He fills believers' hearts with joy, their minds with knowledge, their consciences with peace, their wills with spiritual desires, submission and resignation, and their affections with love for himself and his people. He fills them with all grace and goodness and the fruits of his righteousness. And so he makes them of use to himself and for happiness in eternity. Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2, 1, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you were when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Paul reminds the Ephesians and us about what we were like before Christ called us to salvation. You know what? We were dead. The wages of sin is death. Everyone is destined to death physically and eternally. Every man is destined to die physically and after death to inherit eternal judgment instead of eternal life. Every sinful man is destined to live forever apart from God and tormented in hell, which is worse than death. Why were we dead? Because of our sins. We are dead because of sin. Uh, we are dead because of the sin that we are born into and the sin we choose. We are dead because of both. Because we are dead and blind without hope, we live our lives under the rule of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the prince of this world, Satan. People may not realize they are serving the devil, but in reality, if they're still living in their sin nature, they are. Everyone who's not born again is serving Satan because they're living in obedience to the temptations of Satan and their sin nature. You know what? You cannot serve two masters, but you will serve one of them. Bob Dylan wrote a song where he sang, everybody's got to serve somebody. I always like that song. It's very true. You either serve God or you serve the devil. There's no in between. There is another spirit other than the Holy Spirit at work in those who are living in sin. That doesn't mean everyone who's a sinner is possessed by a demon. What it means is that Satan has free access to the lives of people who live in sin, and they have no way to live a life pleasing to God. No way. They can't be good enough. In the same way, false teachers, false prophets, false apostles, and false Christs also have another spirit. We know that from 1 John 4.1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, 
the test the spirits to see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. We need to be careful of people who teach false doctrines and make false prophecies because they do so because they're following another spirit. Why? Because they don't have the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. They're still living in sin and serving their master, the devil. It's useful to remember that when you're that fact, when you're testing false prophets, John 14, 7, the spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. 1 John 4, 6, we are from God and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. False prophets and false teachers have another spirit. That's the spirit of falsehood or lies. Their father is the devil, the original liar. John 8, 44, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. I wrote an article about this uh, when it states that he was a murderer from the beginning. Of course, we often associate that with Cain, who murdered his brother. But actually, Satan murdered before Cain. How did he do that? He got one third of the angels to follow him into sin. And he virtually uh, guaranteed that they would be sent to hell. He murdered them. Those who teach lies and prophecy, prophesy lies are of another spirit. And that spirit is demonic. Christians must realize how important it is to get away from false teachers and false prophets who are liars. Very important. This is going to be hard for some people to understand, but they are not our brothers in the Lord. They're sons of the devil, basically. Jesus spoke these words to the religious leaders of his day. And we must realize that nothing is ever new under the sun. We still have religious leadership today on TBN, Daystar, leadership on the covers of Time magazine, Christianity Today, Charisma magazine. And unfortunately, they're of another spirit. When you say this and prove it, people will hate you. They have hated me for a long time for proving it. And they will hate you for getting away from these people. So be prepared to be persecuted for your faith by others who claim they're Christians. In fact, claim that they are the most important Christians of our day. When people are proven to be liars, they either repent or become hateful and vengeful. We're seeing that today in politics, aren't we? Ephesians 2.3. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. Those who are in the world, as we were, have nothing else to satisfy them than to follow their sinful minds into sinful things. They do many things the devil tempts them to do, and more things they come up with from their own sinful minds. Don't be fooled. Satan can only tempt. We are the ones who make a choice whether or not to give in to temptations, which is why we are guilty of the wages of death without hope if we are without Christ. We all know the things we did before the Holy Spirit convicted us of our sins and after we had heard the gospel message. So we need not talk about them or list them here. Suffice it to say, we were all under God's wrath. This is what we need to remember about others who are still living in that, in that position. We need to have com compassion on them and warn them of their sin and the penalty they will pay 
because of the holiness of our righteous judge. Ephesians 2, 4, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Who? That's for sure. God loves us so much that because of his mercy, we who were dead in our sins and without eternal life were made alive in Christ, who was raised from the dead. We are made alive in him, just as God raised him from the dead. Also, because Jesus was resurrected from the dead, we will also someday be resurrected into eternal life. You've heard the saying, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The end of this verse states that salvation is by grace. I'll read you some verses. Verses on grace alone. Titus 3, 5 through 7, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Romans eleven six, and if by grace, then it's no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. What about faith alone? Romans 3, 28. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Romans 4, 4 through 5. Now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. And what about Christ alone? John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Acts 14, 12, salvation is found in no one else. Whereas there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Jesus Christ did all the work to save us from our sins. This is summed up nicely in what's called the Romans Road, which I often use if I'm witnessing to people. It's a good thing to memorize and use to explain the gospel message to the unsaved. Let me just give you those verses. Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 5.8, but God demonstrates his own love for us and that while we're still sinners christ died for us romans 6 23 for the wages of sin and death the gift of god is eternal life in christ jesus our lord romans 8 1 therefore there's now no condemnation for those who are in christ jesus romans 10 9 if like if you confess with your mouth jesus is lord and believe in your heart that god raised him from the dead you will be saved and finally, Romans 10, 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Ephesians 2, 6, and God raised us, from, raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to, to us in Christ Jesus. When God raised us to new life in Christ, he gave us, he sets us in the heavenly realms with Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean that we're physically there, but sometimes we will be there. After, you know, some, someday we will be there after the resurrection. But it means that positionally the Father views us as being with Christ, in Christ, seated beside Christ. That's our position, our place in the eyes of the Father. This means that he has saved us and views us as being with Christ and our sins are under the blood of his son, no longer to be counted against us. Our sins, when they are repented of in Christ, are now positionally viewed as no longer existing, being brought away from us as far as the east is from the west. Psalms 103.12, as far as the east is from the west. 
so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Of course, that's an interesting statement. If you stated that our sins are as far as the north is from the south on the earth, that would be a finite distance, a measurable distance. But if you say as far as the east is from the west, you can travel around the earth forever and the east would never meet the west. Where do the east start and the west begin? This is one way of saying that our sins will no longer be counted against us for eternity if we are in Christ. We also share in the fullness of Christ in his riches and glory. This was the plan of God the Father from the beginning, that he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. The love of God for us is amazing. And our position in Christ is a place of victory and spiritual riches, not defeat and spiritual poverty. The sooner we begin to live in that knowledge, the sooner we will be of real use in his kingdom. Ephesians 2.8, for it's by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now, most of you know these two verses by heart, even if you might not know the reference. But these verses are extremely important. We are saved by grace alone, not by our works. If works could save us, then God would not be needed. But our works cannot save us because before we are saved, we're sinners without the will to do good. The Bible states that our thoughts are continually evil before we're saved. Psalm 10.4, in his pride, the wicked does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there's no room for God. Believers in Christ have been saved by grace through faith. That faith is our response to the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the preaching of the gospel. If we, if we respond by placing our faith in Christ, we will be saved by his grace. If we respond by rejecting Christ, we are left in our wicked state. Also be aware that some groups falsely claim that grace and faith are the gift of God talked about in these verses. But here and in other verses, it's clear that the gift of God is grace. Faith is a response to God after God gives us the opportunity to respond. He then will build us up in our faith if we continue to obey Follow him and add to our faith. Hebrews 12, 2 says this, simply fixing our gaze upon Jesus, our prince leader in the faith, who will also award us the prize. He, for the sake of joy which lay before him, patiently endured the cross, looking with contempt upon its shame and afterwards seated himself where he still sits at the right hand of the throne of God. And that's the Weymouth translation by the way jude 120 but you dear friends build yourselves up in the most holy faith and pray in the holy spirit but god never forces anyone to have faith it's their choice and continues to be their choice until the day they die without faith there can be no salvation first peter 1 9 for you are receiving the goal of your faith the salvation of your souls. Salvation is by grace, grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It can never be by works because that would make man his own savior. Here's an illustration. I read about an instant cake mix that was a big flop. The intro introduction said all you had to do was add water and bake. The company couldn't understand why it didn't sell until their research discovered that the buying public felt uneasy about a mix that required only water. Apparently people thought it was too easy. So the company altered the formula and changed the directions to call for adding an egg to the mix in addition to the water. The idea worked and sales jumped dramatically. Well, that story reminds me of how some people react to the uh, plan of salvation. To them, it sounds too easy and simple to be true, 
even though the Bible says by grace, you've been saved through faith. That's the gift of God, not of works. They feel that there's something more they have to do. Something they must add to God's recipe for salvation. They think they need to perform good works to gain God's favor and earn eternal life. But the Bible's clear. We are saved not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy. That's Titus 3.5. Unlike the cake mix manufacturer, God did not change his formula to make salvation more marketable. The gospel we proclaim must be free of works, even though it may sound too easy. But most false religions in the world are based on works, causing a person to be good enough to go to heaven or wherever, nirvana, become a better person, whatever. They try to become like God through their works. They try to be accepted by God or go to heaven based on works. Any religion that adds to salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, is a false religion and is, in fact, demonic. Paul says that anyone who adds to the salvation message is accursed and is on his or her way to hell. Galatians 1, 8 through 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we've already said, so now I say again, if, if anyone has preached to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. The most frequent other gospel in the world today is the gospel of works salvation. Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. When God saves us by his grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then when we obey him, our works count for something. They do not save, but we will, they will count as a reward in heaven. In fact, God created us for the purpose of doing good works in obedience to Jesus Christ. God prepared those he foreknew uh, from, uh, who would believe in his son in advance to do good works. Remember that grace comes first, then faith, then works, not the other way around. According to a, a poll, 88% of Catholics and a majority of Presbyterian and Methodist evangelizers, those who actively try to share their faith, believe that if people are generally good and do enough good things for others during their lives, they will earn a place in heaven. Well, we have a situation in the churches today that's very serious. It's obvious by these kinds of polls that the message of the gospel is not coming through. I have an old videotape where Catholics coming out of a Roman Catholic church are asked on what basis God would accept them into heaven. Only one person on that tape, only one Catholic, knew that the answer was by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. The rest gave the same answer as the poll that I just meant, mentioned. Those of us who know the truth have an obligation to tell people the truth about the gospel today, even though uh, even those who claim to be Christians, sometimes especially those. If they meet Jesus Christ on judgment day and are not in Christ, they will not go to heaven. Remember that there are those who will... Uh, be there on judgment day who are saying didn't i do this and that didn't i proclaim your name and didn't i heal people and raise people from the dead and prophesy in your name etc but um guess what he's gonna say i never knew you away from me you wicked people 